objectively, this is one of the greatest subjects in all the word of God. Um, and then definitely personally, um, it has been the most um, thrilling, the most thrilling thing that I have ever had the privilege of being a part of in all my life would be, would be prayer. And um, because it is such a vast subject, I am very, I'm very joyful that um, you're going to study it locally. That's, that's wonderful um, because there, it's, to me, it seems like inexhaustible resources in the word of God and, and learning in this subject of prayer. But before we, um, before we even jump into a few thoughts, um, I guess I'll say I'm looking forward to the questions and answers very much. Um, but before we even jump into a few thoughts uh, in, from the word, let's pray and ask the Lord just to really guide our time and to use it. Father, we want to bow in your presence in the name of, of Jesus Christ, King of Kings, Lord of Lords, um, the great and awesome God of the heavens, the Lord of the armies, and also the greatest friend that we will ever have in, in all of our life. Um, Lord, we have never met anybody like your son. And um, oh, please, I just want to ask in his name that you would help us to understand. Um, specifically, I just want to copy for our context tonight, the, the prayer of Ephesians 1, that you would open our eyes and that we would see um, the potential, the biblical potential of what prayer is and the gift that is given uh, to the people of God, the way that Christ lived it out. This is like an ocean of a topic. And um, tonight we'll take, um, take our little spoon and we'll enjoy what we're able to get out of that ocean and so we pray, Lord, that you would please guide us along. Um, please open eyes, open hearts, open ears. Help us to see your word and take you at face value. Um, help us believingly to apply these things to our lives. Lord, every good and perfect gift um, is ours. Uh, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places is ours in Christ. And yet we live so frequently on $30,000 a year rather than on. Um, a billion dollars a year spiritually. And we just don't want that, Lord. We want to press on and um, come into the good uh, of the things that, are, that were given us when we came to know Jesus Christ as Savior. So Lord, we're just praying to a God who is, um, who is so kind. Uh, you're standing there in the heavens right now, and you have handfuls of blessing for the people that are on this call. And we pray that in your wisdom, in your pastoral skill, in your perfect shepherding, that you would meet each one where they are and that you would um, draw them, that you would bless them, that you would overcome fears, uh, that you would overcome unbelief where, where necessary. Father, we just um, want you to do tonight what we could never do. Help us as we look through the word of God, guide our discussion, our questions, answers, all of it. We commit it all to you so joyfully in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay, turn, if you would, to Colossians chapter 4. This is, again, this is such a vast subject that um, it's a little hard to know where to start. I mean, you have so many beautiful, beautiful prayers in the Word of God. And rather than digging into one of those, which would be so delightful. And I know that many of you are already intending to do that. Um, I just thought that we would have some uh, hopefully helpful introductory thoughts here, and then we'll trust the Lord to guide our question and answers. So if you're taking notes, um, I call this the activity of prayer. It's Colossians chapter four and verse number two. It says this, continue earnestly in prayer being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. So that little phrase that I wanted to focus on was continue earnestly in prayer. Now this is simple, and yet it's a vital exhortation in, in the word of God that um, we need to be about the physical activity of prayer. Um, I, when I was 15 years old, I lived as a hypocrite for a few months. Uh, most miserable time of my of my Christian life. I've been saved since I was five years old, 
And because of that misery, um, I came back to the Lord. I wholesale repented. And basically, as a 15-year-old, um, I fell in love with serving the Lord. Now, that is an awful lot better than living as a hypocrite. But boy, looking back, I'm 45 now. So we're talking 30 years ago. And um, I look back and I think I missed, I missed so much in this subject of prayer. And it was just due to simple disobedience. Um, I remember, I remember in high school, the Lord drawing me to my Bible. And I would very consistently, sometimes exclusively, prefer activity over intimacy with the Lord. And sometimes that activity was, was football, basketball, running. Um, I loved sports. I played one or two sports in every season. Um, other times that activity was um, summer camp, like Bible camp, uh, youth group, campus life. I volunteered for junior high campus life. I was part of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Like these are wonderful activities and I don't regret those activities. But what I regret is, is simple disobedience. Like in Acts, um, the term is recorded that you always resist the Holy Spirit. And I think Again, I'm, I, I try to be fair. Like, even with myself, I try to be fair. But I think it's fair to say that that's characteristic of my life when I look back, when it comes to the subject of, of prayer. Like, I vastly preferred activity over obedience um, to the Lord. And you'll notice as I talk, um, Prayer to me is intimacy with Christ. It's the overflow of a love relationship with Christ. Now, I didn't know that when I, when I first started obeying these things that we're going to look at tonight. I didn't know that. Um, it was really a desperation that drove us to pray. To pray. And, um, and through obedience that came out of desperation, eventually that prayer gave birth to communion. And at first I didn't even know what to call it. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah, it, it's been such a journey of, of learning and um, I'm still like a kindergartner. I mean, but I, man, I enjoy learning when it comes to this subject. So I wanted to just make a couple simple points. Um, I have suffered and then it, because of a lack of obedience to these admonitions to continue earnestly in prayer. Um, I have watched uh, very close friends, very gifted men, men that know the word of God um, multiple times better than me, uh, men that are very profitable. They would all, I mean, I could list them off and I'll, I'll let them tell their own stories, but they would all say the same thing, that they were, they were good um, if you just want to talk on a human level, they were good in their studies, like they were good in their libraries. Um, they were students of the word, but they were poor to sinfully negligent in um, this subject of prayer. And so this is a very sober thing. It's a very serious thing. Prayer and the word of God um, are like two wings of a bird, and, and you cannot soar without both of those. So Nobody would ever say, hey, let's now replace uh, service with intimacy. That would be foolish and it would be unbiblical. But what we are saying is that we missed the boat when it came to um, John 15, abiding in the vine, to admonitions just like this, continue earnestly in prayer. And so I know that this is super simple, but I, I still feel like this is such a profitable place to start that um, you look at the life of Christ. He was overwhelmingly a man of prayer, so much so that his followers came to him. I mean, they recognized something that was totally different than other Jewish men and than themselves. And they came to him and they said, Lord, would you please teach us to pray? Right. I mean, they just saw like this, this guy, and I'm saying this re respectfully, this person that we're following, like he is leading a totally different life than me. And he seems to have something that I don't have. And so um, Christ lived these things. Paul lives these things. And he admonishes the Christians that the physical activity of prayer must be um, a part of your, a part of your life. So I, I yeah, it's so simple, but, but there it is right there.
Um, continue earnestly in prayer. In other words, there's no plan B. Um, don't give up on prayer. Don't stop praying. Um, if prayer has not been um, a part of your life like it is in Christ's life, then, um, and I'm not saying this to burden the people of God, I'm saying this to set them free, right? But boy, repent of that and just say, say, Lord, I recognize that this is, this is not a, as big a part of my life as it is a part of your life. And my life does not match up with the word of God. And so I'm asking you to forgive me. And then as quick as I can get the words out of my mouth, in Christ's name, I'm asking you to lead me into all that's biblical. And it is such a soul thrilling journey this um yeah yeah a life of intimacy with the lord um that expresses itself in prayer so the physical activity of prayer um turn to the right if you would in my bible it's one nope two pages first thessalonians chapter five so turn to the right a couple pages and we'll move on to point number two And this would be um, the relationship of prayer. This came as a total shock. Um, again, I'll say this again. Uh, I, we started praying years ago. I started praying years ago because of desperation. We saw a downward trend amongst the people of God that was very concerning. Um, we did our best to study harder, to preach harder. Um, we, we um, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I find myself reticent to even say this, but... I think it's fair just to look back and say, we worked as hard as we could possibly work. And the Lord eventually brought us to the end of ourselves. And so we realized that we desperately need God. And, um, and we started praying. And then um, that activity of prayer gave birth to something that totally shocked me. And, and honestly, it rocked my world. This is what blows my mind about my relationship with Christ every day now is the relationship of prayer. So now let's, again, this is a big subject too, but um, let's read it. First Thessalonians chapter five, verse 17. It says, pray without ceasing. Now that is describing a relationship. And I'll look at a few other scriptures that, that I think are even, well, they're, they're very helpful in this point as well. Um, it's not saying go into a prayer closet and never come out. Like there's so many misconceptions of, of prayer. In fact, I'll throw this out there. Someone can ask about it later if they want to. But you can see behind me a map of North America. Um, I just want to, this is kind of personal. Like I'm, I hesitate to even say these things. But one thing that the Lord has me doing is, is consistently, um, systematically laboring in prayer for North America. And one thing that's really been a surprise recently is oftentimes praying in the spirit is shorter as opposed to longer. There are times that, that it's longer for sure. Um, yeah, Christ prayed all night at times when things, when, when his service for God, um, necessitated that. But, um, but oftentimes praying in the spirit, you can, you can pray to a place of peace. Um, the Puritans would have referred to that as breaking through to God. Um, praying until you get an answer. Um, you can pray until that point, and sometimes it's five minutes. That's pretty delightful. In fact, this kind of dawned on me recently. How on earth could the Apostle Paul pull off a prayer life like his epistles would give witness to? And what I mean is that guy talked about prayer all the time, and he constantly said he was praying for people. And he held up other people that pray, like Epaphras and, and different, different ones. And it dawned, it's dawned on me recently that, that it's not always laboring in prayer for hours. Um, it, yeah, anyways, I'm not going to go further into that. But here in this text, it says pray without ceasing. So pray and don't stop praying. Uh, we could go to the Gospels where it would say pray and faint not. Um, this is... Um, yeah, I, I call this, for, for my purposes, the relationship of prayer. Um, I don't think for sake of time, I'll, I'll flip you all over the place in your Bibles. But in Jude 20 and 21, um, it has these two little phrases. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And then right next to that, 
Praying in the Spirit. Boy, that is a delightful topic. Right? So right there, butt it up right next to each other. Keep yourselves in the love of God relationship. Praying in the Holy Spirit. Um, John 15, 9 through 16 is the same thing. Abide in me. Um, abide in my love. In other words, don't leave the place that I love you. And if you trace down through that passage, the end result of abiding, obeying, a yielded life, a friendship with God, like you can see these points in one reading through the text. The end result of it is a proper prayer life. Ask anything you want and it, and it will be given to you. And so um, you can see in all of these passages, the relationship of prayer. This is, again, God, God help me. Um, I mean, this is like holy ground, like God help me seriously to say these things the right way. Um, this is the most soul thrilling part of prayer that, that I have ever experienced. Now there's an inexhaustible um, ocean of prayer to enter into. There's travail, which is the hardest work I've ever done in my life period um, of any kind of work I've ever done. And, and that's, it's biblical prayer. Um, Hannah, Anna, um, Elijah, James 5 records, records um, praying earnestly with all, um, with all prayer and supplication. Um, anyways, yeah, so there's all these different kinds of prayer, but communion with God, the relationship of prayer, um, and he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there, none others ever known. The relationship of prayer daily blows my mind that I have a real relationship with God. Like I just can't, I cannot get over that. Um, I, I think I'm as blessed as anybody on planet earth when it comes to friendship. Like I, I love the family of God. Um, I've said this for for 30 or 40 years. Like, I just love the family of God. The Christians are the greatest people in the world. And um, man, I know that we're so faulted, but that does not change the fact that they're the greatest. And this is the greatest family in the world. Like, I just totally love it. And by far, I mean, so much that there's no hardly second place. Jesus Christ is the most overwhelmingly joyful friendship that I have ever enjoyed in all my life and that expresses itself in prayer and so like typically um in north america when you say prayer what people think of is supplication and um really we're moving now from supplication which is biblical by the way um praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit ephesians 6 um but we're moving from simply recognizing God has inexhaustible resources and we can go to him to get grace to help in time of need. All that's biblical, but we're moving from that into this, this relationship. So in the garden of Eden, what was broken when Adam and Eve sinned, when Adam as the federal head of the human race sinned, the relationship was broken. That's what spiritual death is, Right, And so then you have this promise, the seed of the woman will crush the, the serpent's head. The Lord perfectly accomplished that at, at Calvary. Christ died a substitutionary death. He was buried. He rose again victoriously and ascended on high. What was put back together by Christ's substitutionary atonement? A love relationship. And I'm, and I'm not making this up. Like these things are so incredibly important. Um, what would be the theological justification for that? Like the clear biblical evidence for that. It's Romans 1 through 8. The greatest exposition that, that mankind has of what the gospel is, is Romans 1 through 8. And at the end of chapter 8, three times it makes statements like, who shall separate us from the love of Christ. In fact, this is so important. You don't have to turn, but let me just read them to you. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Verse 35. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Verse 37. Nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so it's a love relationship. What's the point of the gospel? Love relationship. What was broken in the garden? Love relationship. 
What kind of savior is Christ? He's the savior of Luke 19, the one that wept over the city of Jerusalem, the one that weeps over souls today. Why does he want people back? So that they can for all eternity raise their hands and say, oh, you're so great, oh, you're so great, oh, you're so great. Um, he wants them back because he, he's, God is love. He wants an eternal love relationship. And yes, absolutely it's for his, for his glory. It all is so overwhelmingly glorifying to him. And yet, and yet this is what, this is, I think it's the heart and soul of prayer. And it's what makes prayer a delight rather than a burden. Now, again, let me, let me say this. Um, I still have this almost subconscious part of me that treats prayer like um, a task. Yeah, it treats it like a task. Yeah, rather than communion with God, fellowship, fellowship with God. Like even my map. Um, yeah, and I'm only saying these things to, hoping that the Lord will want to maybe be helpful to someone. Um, but boy, when I, uh, as the Lord has directed me, when I obey that, I really end up, I just fellowship with, Lord, with the Lord about his heart for North America. Yeah. And that's in that, and sometimes it's travail, and it's you feel like you're going to be crushed by the burden of God. Um, sometimes it's supplication, sometimes it's fellowship. Um, like it, it praying in the spirit will take on every different biblical form of prayer, which they're very varied. And I'm thrilled for you that you're going to study these things, like to study out the different forms of prayer, thanksgiving, intercession. I mean, it's a glorious subject to study. So this relationship of prayer, um, it's the living out of a love relationship with the most amazing person that any of us will ever meet in all of our existence for eternity period. Amen? And I know you're on mute, but um, yeah, yeah. I mean, God help us to live in the good of this. Like, yeah. I look back and like John, when you and I were at Storybook Lodge preaching away and I mean, the Lord, by his grace, chose to use the word. Of course, he's going to use the word. And, and he chose, by grace, to use such broken little vessels. Um, and yet I look back and I just, I just, um, I can't hardly believe I missed it, you know. So, and I know, I know this one won't mind. Like, I'll go ahead and say it. But Mike Atwood, like, if he was on this call, he would say, I would rather die then go back to the way I lived my Christian life six years ago. And what he's referring to is the relationship of prayer with the, with the Lord. Like he just so, he so missed it. Um, Warren Henderson uh, would, three years ago at the week of prayer, he stood up publicly, it's on tape, uh, he stood up and he said, I've only learned to pray in the last two years, right? And he just finished his Old Testament commentary. Like you can buy his complete Old Testament commentary set. Like the guy is such a diligent student, and yet he just totally missed the boat on this on this subject. And and I I think you guys would assume this, but these are men that I absolutely love and respect. And yeah, I can't even believe that they're willing to be friends with me, honestly. But but yeah, okay. So you have the activity of prayer. You have the relationship of prayer. Uh, for the sake of time, let's keep moving. Go to First uh, Peter chapter four. First Peter chapter four and verse number seven. If you're taking notes, this is, I, I call this the attitude of prayer. Like what should be our attitude when we think of prayer? First Peter four, verse seven. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, again, this is simple. Um, and man, my heart is so much more. I mean, of course, like I, I would love to teach the people of God in, in anything that's helpful. But my heart is so much more to ask, how does your life look compared to that scripture? Right? Not just teaching the truths, right? But actually seeing the word of God applied to people's lives. So let's take just a moment here and think. Um, we have, according to this, we have 34 participants on this call. 
And I think, I think you could likely go through every single person. And if you knew that person well enough, you could pick out what they're serious about. Like this person's serious about fitness. This person's serious about healthy eating, right? And by the way, I'm choosing things that are all good. They are all good things. There's a guy named John Biorley that spoke on being a good steward of your body years ago at, at um, a workers and elders conference. And, and these are good things, right? And I'm choosing good things on purpose, right? They're not, I'm not saying they're negative, but I do want to ask the question, people that know you well and please like please in the name of christ tremble before the word of god appropriately people that know you well would they say that you are serious about prayer and again i'm not saying this to heap burdens on the people of god i'm saying this for a very specific purpose that we would be set free by the word of god to live christ-like lives and to come into the good of all that he wants for us. I mean, he's so overwhelmingly kind. He's the God of Psalm 81. Open your mouth wide and I will fill it. The river of God is full of water. Like the scripture just drips with the abundance of God. Isaiah 55. All who thirst come to me. Right? He has so much blessing for you. But if we're not honest with him about these things, then we end up being stuck and we hold ourselves at a distance from his blessing rather than coming into his blessing. So are you serious about prayer? I don't mean it's the only thing that you would ever do. Uh, that wouldn't be true of Christ, right? He's our great example. Mark chapter one, he had a very, very long, busy day of service for God. And then the next day he arose early in the morning and he went off by himself to pray. That's a Christ-like life, right? So one day was overwhelmingly characterized by activity for God, the next day was characterized by running off to the mountains for intimacy with God. That's a Christ-like life. How many times did, did the crowds press in on him? You could tell, like, as he became popular, well, really famous, um, it was hard for him to get the time alone that, that a person needs, that a person has or that a person should have with God. I think many mothers understand that. Like you have to really fight, right? To try to get time. Like that's, that's, it's a very different challenge in a mother's or a wife's life as opposed to a husband or a father. So are you serious about prayer? It's a simple admonition. Um, but if we would honestly say tonight, okay, my life doesn't show that, then um, I heartily encourage you um, this can take place like in a, in the twinkling of an eye. I heartily encourage you to say to the Lord, you have shown me myself in the word of God. Um, and I fall short um, of the standard that I see. Uh, my life historically has not shown that I'm serious about prayer, but I want to live a Christ like life of prayer. And I desperately need your help. And um, I know this would be true of many, many, many of you. Um, but I know the Lord Jesus well enough at this point to know that at a prayer like that he smiles and he rubs his hands together and he says praise god um, because he's been waiting for so long to bless you and to love you and to grow you right the worst thing that's ever happened to me in my life is me um i look back and i just think scott right you could have come into so much more so much earlier if you had cooperated rather than than thinking, well, this is what I wanted my ministry to be like, or this is what I wanted my service to be like, or, or um, being caught up with so many earthly things where Titus says, denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. Anyways, so yeah, there it is, right there in the word of God. Be serious and watchful in your prayers. Now, if you wanted to dig, and we're not going to do this, but that Greek word is really fun. Um, the idea of self-restrained disciplined um yeah like there's so many passages that we're kind of like skipping across here um that are really really fun to dig into and they're very encouraging right the same way an athlete disciplines himself a christian disciplines himself the way an athlete excels when he disciplines a christian excels when he disciplines um but discipline is just the start of it that's point number one um the activity of prayer that's discipline and that gives birth to point number two, the relationship of prayer. 
um, which as we press on shows us whether or not we're in conformity with point number three. Are you serious about prayer or the attitude of prayer? And then finally, um, let's look at one more. And I'm, I, I'm eager to hear um, any, any questions that the Lord's people have. So Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15 and verse number 30. This, uh, if you're taking notes, I call this the partnership of prayer. And again, you can see this all over the place too. But Romans 15, verse 30. Now I beg you, brethren, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Here, let's stop there for a second. Who's speaking? It's Paul, of course, right? Um, how does the apostle present this topic? He says, I beg you. Right? Is Paul being serious? Yeah, he is. He is. Like, he's very, very earnest about this and that's how he presents it he says i beg you right so following that example man with any opportunity that i would have um i would beg i would beg the people of god to enter into these things um he says i beg you brethren through the lord jesus christ and through the love of the spirit that you strive together with me in your prayers to god for me that word strive in the greek it is um to to share in a contest. So it's the idea of like a football team. Everyone plays their, their role, right? It's not a one-man show. Greek wrestlers would be, of course, a much more historically accurate illustration. Three wrestlers go into, right? Three come in from this side, three come in from this side. At the end of the contest, three are dead, and however many of these guys survived, right? They leave. They're the only ones that leave. And that's the idea. It's, a, it's a, an earnest striving together in prayer. Um, you could look at 2 Corinthians 1.11, and you find Paul, uh, same author, of course. He says, you also helping in your prayers. You look at Philippians 1, right? There's a partnership um, through prayer in the gospel. So you could just keep going. This is a striving together in prayer. So out here in California, we have a team of three families, and we live in a community that it feels like living in a different country. Now, we totally love it. Like, this is our mission field. And um, it's 90 to 95% Spanish speaking as a first language. Um, we've had missionaries that have spent 20 years in Mexico come here, and as we walk them around town, one of them uh, quietly cried and said, how on earth did you guys find this place? And we said, oh, we didn't find this place. Like we prayed. And this is where the spirit of God directed us to move. Um, and he said, I can't, I didn't even know places like this existed um, in the States. To him, it felt just like where he had served amongst the mountain people in his region of Mexico. And my point is, is simple. Um, we experience spiritual warfare on a more, um, more direct level, more drastic level, than, than ever before in our lives. Um, our latest, I, I'm sure he wouldn't mind me saying this, but our most recent family on the team out here, um, the husband is Micah Williams. I think probably many of you know him. He was the director at Turkey Hill Ranch Bible Camp for many years. Anyways, his first month on the ground out here, um, I think it'd be fair to say it was kind of brutal. Um, I, I don't know how many times I went over to his house to pray with him. And I remember him with teary eyes saying, I hope none of you guys ever have to go through this. At one point, we called a godly, a godly counselor, a godly man, and talked it all through with him. Um, we, all I'm saying is um, the battle is so tangible. Um, it's so evident. And, um, and it's just, man, it makes you value the partnership of prayer. Like people that will pray. Um, I, yeah, the Lord has been kind of pushing us together in prayer. What I mean by that is like when Micah was struggling so much, like he was urging me to go pray with Micah. Um, I've, I've been on the forefront numerous times recently and I'll call one of the men and we'll pray together. And the grace, um, in my life, the grace that is evident, like the post prayer experience as opposed to the pre-prayer experience is so um, obvious. It, it's just obvious that prayer makes a difference. 
So, and I think I'll, I'll finish my comments with this. Christ lived with the assumption that prayer, that prayer mattered, that prayer would make a difference. The Apostle Paul lived with the assumption and the doctrinal teaching that prayer would make a difference. If, if people would physically commit themselves to pray, then it would make a difference. What kind, and this is, we're launching off into another topic here, but what kind of prayer is it that makes a difference, right? The effective, that Greek word is vital, right? That word, it's energeo in its root. The effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. So I'm going to be quiet. Like I'm going to, I'm going to stop talking, but um, this is a glorious subject and um, yeah, God help us to, um, God help us to enter in.